This is section 48 of Mark Twain's Speeches by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Old Fashioned Printer by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. Address at the Typothety Dinner given at Delmonico's January 18, 1886, commemorating the birthday of Benjamin Franklin. Mr. Clemens responded to the toast, The Compositor. The chairman's historical reminiscences of Gutenberg have caused me to fall into reminiscences, for I myself am something of an antiquity. All things change in the procession of years, and it may be that I am among strangers. It may be that the printer of today is not the printer of thirty-five years ago. I was no stranger to him. I knew him well. I built his fire for him in the winter mornings. I brought his water from the village pump. I swept out his office. I picked up his type from under his stand, and, if he were there to see, I put the good type in his case and the broken ones among the hell matter, and if he wasn't there to see, I dumped it all with the pie on the imposing stone, for that was the furtive fashion of the cub, and I was a cub. I wetted down the paper Saturdays, I turned it Sundays for this was a country weekly. I rolled, I washed the rollers, I washed the forms, I folded the papers, I carried them around at dawn Thursday mornings. The carrier was then an object of interest to all the dogs in town. If I had saved up all the bites I ever received, I could keep Monsieur Pasteur busy for a year. I enveloped the papers that were for the mail, we had a hundred town subscribers and three hundred and fifty country ones. The town subscribers paid in groceries, and the country ones in cabbages and cordwood, when they paid at all, which was merely sometimes. And then we always stated the fact in the paper and gave them a puff, and if we forgot it, they stopped the paper. Every man on the town list helped edit the thing, that is, he gave orders as to how it was to be edited, dictated its opinions, marked out its course for it, and every time the boss failed to connect, he stopped his paper. We were just infested with critics, and we tried to satisfy them all over. We had one subscriber who paid cash, and he was more trouble than all the rest. He bought us once a year, body and soul, for two dollars he used to modify our politics every which way, and he made us change our religion four times in five years. If we ever tried to reason with him, he would threaten to stop his paper, and, of course, that meant bankruptcy and destruction. That man used to write articles a column and a half long, leaded long primer, and sign them Junius or Veritas or vox populi, or some other high-sounding rot. And then, after it was set up, he would come in and say he had changed his mind, which was a gilded figure of speech because he hadn't any, and order it to be left out. We couldn't afford bogus in that office, so we always took the leads out, altered the signature, credited the article to the rival paper in the next village, and put it in. Well, we did have one or two kinds of bogus. Whenever there was a barbecue or a circus or a baptizing, we knocked off for half a day. And then, to make up for short matter, we would turn over ads, turn over the whole page and duplicate it. The other bogus was deep philosophical stuff, which we judged nobody ever read. So we kept a galley of it standing and kept on slapping the same old batches of it in every now and then, till it got dangerous. Also, in the early days of the telegraph, we used to economize on the news. We picked out the items that were pointless and barren of information, and stood them on the galley, and changed the dates and localities, and used them over and over again, till the public interest in them was worn to the bone. 
we marked the ads but we seldom paid any attention to the marks afterward so the life of a t d ad and a t f ad was equally eternal i have seen a t d notice of a share of sale still booming serenely along two years after the sale was over the sheriff dead and the whole circumstance become ancient history most of the yearly ads were patent medicine stereotypes and we used to fence with them i can see that printing office of prehistoric times yet with its horse bills on the walls its d boxes clogged with tallow because we always stood the candle in the k box nights its towel which was not considered soiled until it could stand alone and other signs and symbols that marked the establishment of that kind in the mississippi valley and i can see also the tramping jour who flitted by in the summer and tarried a day with his wallet stuffed with one shirt and a hat full of handbills for if he couldn't get any type to set he would do a temperance lecture his way of life was simple his needs not complex all he wanted was plate and bed and money enough to get drunk on and he was satisfied but it may be as i have said that i am among strangers and sing the glories of a forgotten age to unfamiliar ears so i will make even and stop end of the old-fashioned printer by mark twain read by john greenman